So um yeah, so uh, he come to our next uh, keynote sections. So uh, we are great to have uh, Maddie to talk about the state of the uh, APEC industry from the tech, business, and regulation uh, perspective. So uh, as I said, uh, Maddie is actually in different time zone and he wake up really uh, early today. So really thanks for your support. So uh, Maddie, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, are you able to see my slide in full screen? Yep. Um. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's okay. It's okay now. Thank you. Everything works. Yep. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, and and I'm really glad to be able to to open API at Hong Kong with uh, let's say few principles on the uh, business side, tech side, and regulation side that we've seen uh, across all the API conferences and 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 especially in uh, areas who started, let's say, to shift to an API mindset a little bit earlier. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the founder and chairman of API Days for people who didn't see the, uh, the earlier presentation. I'm the founder of OAuth.io, um, an API identity platform that has been acquired in 2017. And uh, I also teach at some business schools about the API economy. And, uh, and uh, I also built some, uh, some developer tools for uh, privacy uh, regulation. So just to tell you a little bit uh, what I'm building these days. And especially I've been a European Commission expert on APIs for government. So that helped me to, to publish some uh, some content. So uh, you can uh, check my latest publications uh, on API programming interfaces in government, the why, why and how, uh, continuous API management, the book published by O'Reilly uh, that having a second edition soon, and also a research report about GDPR data portability. You know, when there is no APIs, but you still want uh, the data transferred, uh, how you can use regulation for that. I also designed the API industry landscape. So it's a, a, a 700 tools on the API industry that you should look at. So you can go on api-landscape.com and you will be able to see a, an interactive and live version uh, of, of this landscape to follow exactly uh, what tools are actually uh, 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 trending or not. So I'll just start this uh, presentation by uh, a quote from uh, Jeff Lawson, the CEO of Twilio, that was a, a speaker of, of one of previous APIs conference. He said the world is getting broken down into APIs as every part of the stack of business that a developers might need to build is eventually turning into APIs that developers can use. So it reminds me a little bit what uh, what all we made in the 20th century in supply chain, you know. Uh, you know, today, car manufacturers, most of the time, they, they, they'd they have to manufacture cars composed by 30,000 pieces of of, uh, of of furniture. But the thing is, uh, they only build a few of them. Most of the time, they mostly orchestrate hundreds or thousands of suppliers. Who every, And because every of these suppliers does one thing really well, they specialize into building just a turning wheel or just the wheels or just the tires or just uh, some uh, some specific pieces. They're able to orchestrate everything. So this is a little bit what we are seeing in the API space and that I really wanted to share as an introduction is that it seems that we are having the same division of work. Most of the software is being specialized into one capability, and this capability is exposed to others via an API. So the main goal of companies will be to either expose what they can do with APIs or integrate what other expose with their APIs and on their on their specialty. So that means that now everybody is an API provider that will be consumed by others, but on the other side, as an API provider, you are the consumer of another API provider. So you can see here not the physical supply chain, but the digital supply chain of the API economy. I consume APIs from others to deliver new APIs to be consumed by others, and, and so on and so forth. So I will finish this introduction by two axioms of the API economy, and uh, that really we've seen and that enable the success of so many companies is that organizations will provide core competencies through APIs, directly by APIs. They will focus on their core and open it to others. And for support function, they will consume core competencies of other through API. If I'm a payment company, I will provide payment APIs. That's my core business. But maybe my HR, maybe my social network marketing, maybe my uh, payroll, my taxes will be done by other people API as a support. So my core business is the support of others. And, and, uh, and, and, and the support of others is actually their core businesses. So this is actually how you can see the big shift moving on a business side. So you can imagine a little bit like a supply chain. Imagine a physical supply chain when you have a third-party APIs that's your raw material. 
you have the internal APIs, that's your internal processes, services, algorithm that will enhance our data, that will enhance and work the product to add value. And you have your open APIs, what you open to others, like what you ship to others in a sense. So if you go deeper, um, on third party, this is what we call sometimes integration or to have partnership with specific uh, API consumption in these partnerships. On the internal API aspect, sometimes this is how you, the challenge of agility, how you can develop software faster by being more modular services, uh, how you can reduce IT costs by enabling reuse uh, and discoverability across your services, or how you can enhance your business breadth by having the business stakeholders being able to understand what the IT team is doing, because if you think your APIs in terms of product, on a public API side, it's also a bit B2B expansions, you know, becoming a platform, opening APIs for people to be able to build application on top of your uh, uh, ecosystem. It's about innovation. You know, if you onboard new players that will consume your services in original ways, you will learn about some market niche that you may have forgotten and that, 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 they will, and that you will be able to address later. It's also about compliance because we will see that some regulations oblige to open APIs, especially in banking or healthcare, but we can see that it's coming in on other, on other uh, places. So let's focus on the internal API first. So let's, uh, we will go with nine, <laughs> nine main points, nine axioms of this. So on the internal aspect, APIs are here to, ena to enable to align business goals with IT. The first one to think that was Jeff Bezos from Amazon when he, in 2002, he sent this letter to every employee. So it's a famous letter called the Jeff Bezos mandate uh, for people who know it. So I don't, you will be able to have access to the slide, but he says all team will need to use service interfaces. There will be no other way where we can communicate. Uh, it doesn't matter what technology, it's about the interface. So he was really one of the first to understand the, the ability to interact with each other inside a company on the internal aspect. But the most important point is the fifth point. All services, all services interfaces, with that exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. He doesn't say to be externalized, but externalizable. That means that if at some point we need to open it, it should be ready. So it should be customer ready, it should be clean, it should be documented, it should be easy to use. So uh, uh, like this, if we need to open it to other internally or externally, it's ready. So this readiness enable a lot of uh, agility on the market and, and saving a lot of time to market for many products. If you follow the sentence, that is to say the team must plan and design to be able to expose the interface to the developers in the outside world, no exception. So that means you should be able to design and expose the interface to the outside world at any time. This is really the first mindset about aligning IT and business. If your IT capabilities are ready to support the business and they're ready to be open for business, in a, as a service economy where people consume each other, your, your time to market is the lowest possible and you are definitely a winner. And this is what happened with AWS, with the ability to ship software faster and enable to give access to infrastructure faster. And so it comes from this mindset, aligning business and IT, right? Of course, you'd say anyone that do, do, do this will be fired. That was a, the threat about the governance, about how to make it happen. It's not today, there are many other ways to make it happen. Uh, and uh, yes, but just this mandate was really one of the first to understand this ability to align IT and business with APIs. So what does that mean is that the team of corporate software teams it was mostly to control data, make it secure, make it available and build applications. It could take a few years. Now the, the goal of the company is to control the data, make it secure, available, define policies for data use, you know, govern how the data will be shared and use who has access to what, build and maintain APIs, like building bricks of capabilities, and then build applications based on these bricks or opening to others who will build third-party application on top of it. So that's a complete mindset. It's not mindset. It's not just you plan, you control, and you build applications. No, you build the bricks that will enable the application to be built on top. For large organization or large ecosystem, it's a lot more scalable because by building these com business components, these API capabilities, you will be able definitely to, uh, to scale horizontally and vertically on this. This is an example of what BBVA, one of the most biggest bank in the Spanish market, uh, in the Spanish language market, uh, have done. So, you know, you can see you have the retail customer API, the retail account, the retail cards, you have the loans, the notification, uh, you have the, the business, business accounts, you have you have uh, the data APIs, like you get you, every part is really a component 
right? Uh, it's a component of the stack. So they really cut their big stack into small pieces that they enable to deliver directly by API uh, as the raw material for any banking application. And you know what? Uh, it works. Uh, in this book, Marshall Van Aslin, in the book Platform Revolution, Marshall Van Aslin demonstrates the impact of API on firm performance. And he shows that a company is adopting a strong API strategy have in average 12% higher public valuation because the, they are making shifting to a more platform and ecosystem uh, uh, business model and that the market is value, is is seeing and actually they value this kind of strategy a lot more than classic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, produce and sell uh, strategy. So yeah, it, it, has, it can have significant impact. The fact that you think in terms of APIs and you open them to become a platform and soon an ecosystem. So... Yeah, it pays, it pays back. The second point is about designing for business as citizen goals. So if you, a lot of people love to compare APIs to building bricks or Legos. <laughs> and so, yeah, but let's remind that API is just the interface. You know, the body of the brick is really the service, as we call the service or the microservice. The API is really the interface. And if you connect the service to the business capability with the nice interface, you are plugging it in the right way. If you design the API towards the implementation, what will happen? If you change the service technology, you will break the interface. So if you design your APIs toward business capabilities, you will be able to refactor your system, your services, make them evolve, never breaking the API. So that's extremely important to design for business capability. That's a reminder of Werner Vogels from uh, uh, Amazon Web Services CTO, who said that we knew that designing APIs was a very important task. I do have only one, one chance to get it right. And he, he had APIs are forever. It means code can change below the interface, but if you are the interface, who is a technical interface, but also business interface, doesn't have change if it's well designed. Let's take an example with cars. You know, technology has shifted a lot over the last 100 years, uh, you know, but most of the time we, kind of keep the same design. Even if now electric cars are completely working differently, we still have a turning wheel. We still have, at some point, some gear management. We still have some dashboard. Even with technology have completely evolved, we still have the same design because it's designed toward the user, toward the capability, not toward the technology. We didn't design because of the technology. We designed because of a user ability and the user consumption. So what does that mean? If we are able to design, to keep the interface and not, um, uh, and not changing what's in the back, we are able to refactor systems. So let's go back to our business capability and to the, our Lego brick. You have an API, right? You have an API or self API, and you have a big monolith doing WXYZ capability. Of course, this is a, just a, a schematic explanation, but you will understand on the business side, what does that mean? Just imagine now I will build the first capability called W as a specific service, as an independent, a smaller service uh, directly. So like this, I will be able to transition little by little by doing specific new services, replacing the exact capabilities of my previous monolith, right? And at the end, I will be able to, uh, to have replicated my existing monolith capabilities, but I've never changed the API. So the API can be really a facade layer enabling to always serve the business by changing what's behind the scene. You know, so that's and, and never actually breaking any real capability because I've done, I've replicated all my monolith capabilities over time. So don't don't hesitate to use this API facade, but also this API mindset about designing toward the business capability. Because if I had an API that was linked to my monolith, if I change my monolith, I'm breaking everything and I'm breaking my business. So you can think APIs about refactoring your existing services and existing infrastructure if you design them toward the business. That's what uh, a company like Uber did. For example, Uber had a monolith architecture at the beginning, right? Really monolith doing everything, passenger management, billing, notification, payment, driver management, trip management with some add-ons. And, uh, oh. yeah. and, and actually Uber did, uh, it doesn't appear on my slide, but Uber uh, did the, the exact um, uh, same thing. I'll just check. Yeah, so at least I, don't, I didn't know why it was not appearing, but here you can see the Uber did like actually the, the, the componentization, right, directly by API. So driver management is now uh, used by uh, connected by an API to passenger management, to billing, to payment, to notification in this services approach. So yeah, this is actually a way to refactor your monolith. 
So it's also a way to get business stakeholder adoption. So I often use this uh, <laughs> this uh, this nice uh, uh, picture about like you. We build Lego bricks, but people use what they want. They they have their own use case on the Lego bricks. So they only see the shadow. They only want to see the shadow. Uh, if so, my capabilities are that I produce will generate use cases. Sometimes I don't know. It's about the imagination of the business. So just imagine now. Imagine here. I try to. Um, uh, to if I give you all this access to these services or these APIs, you know that's really really weird. You will have really a lot of issues to understand what's going on uh, and what actually my IT system can deliver. But if I make you this user infos, driver infos, payment ratings, your location invoicing, SMS maps, pricing, you kind of okay as a business stakeholder, I understand what I can do with it. I I I, I if they are exposed in a way that really serves the business. And so the business can understand what the IT pro is producing, you know, like, uh, you know, understand I can make a kind of ride sharing application there. Payment, invoicing, geolocation, drivers, you know, pricing, maps, and SMS. So this is an example of, uh, of course, Uber is a lot more complex behind the scene. Uh, this is, you can see actually the real service uh, map uh, from, uh, from Uber behind the scene. But if you explain things in a way that people can understand on the business side, they will be able to innovate faster and innovate better. So let's focus on the public API side. So we focused on the internal side. Let's go on the public API side. You can also add, uh, you have a new, you can maximize your market reach with uh, specific integrations. Let's see how does that work. So it's true, you know, there was a famous quote that we used to say, uh, in 2000, we had websites. Uh, it used to be digital, you need to have websites. In 2010, you need mobile apps to be digital, right? To be mobile. In 2020, you need APIs and the goal actually is to be now integrated into everybody else's website and everybody else's mobile application. So now it's the horizontal colonization because the goal was to have websites used by many people, mobile apps used by many people. Now the goal with APIs is to be in everybody else's website and everybody else's mobile application. So the maximum reach, so reach is bigger, but distribution channels have diminishing returns. So that means, for example, you used to have web traffic Mobile traffic, sometimes it's a lot bigger. And then, but you have now this long tail of traffic like partners, connected device, e-commerce integration, suppliers, ERPs, and stuff like that. That's what we call the long tail strategy. But what happens is that some now, with so many new channels, the long tail is significant, is significant in terms of community traffic, but costly to address. So what does that mean is that if you can't address the long tail uh, 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 directly, you're losing a huge part of the traffic. But with APIs, you lower your ability to have this reach on the business side. And so what does that mean is that if you are able to address them, you, you may be able to reach the bigger part of the market that was unaddressed by, uh, by the market because it was too hard to manage, to access, but you are able to access it. And that may represent sometimes the main part of your traffic. So it's really important to understand in terms of channels that lowering the cost of addressing new channels enable you to address more channels and at the end, which are most of the time underserved because nobody could address them before. And so like this, you are able to completely uh, uh, win completely new markets. That's what we call extended enterprise, uh, originally from supply chain or elastic enterprise or uh, exponential organization. Three books I highly recommend you to read. Uh, but yeah, so that's really this idea about being bigger than your own walls, being bigger than your own systems because you will be embedded into other people's systems. And that's actually uh, what uh, Simon Torrance uh, in his book Fightback demonstrate as embedded finance. He showed that finance, you know, the top 30 global back insurers are today 3.6 trillion. But if they are be able to embed their value proposition in everybody else's application, they could actually double the full value, you know, insurance, lending and payments and stuff like that. If they're able to embed it, not just in banking applications, but banking in other people's applications. So it's not being open, it's being embedded. That's the real strategy. But new business models, you know, the term as a service, you know, it means that we're really in the digital infrastructure business models, meaning that uh, someone else will build software you to reintegrate into your system and you will build software that people will consume as a service in their system. So that's a big mindset shift. And so that brings us a new business model, like consumption business models. In 2013, John Musser, founder of Programmable Web, made this map about like all the different business models that actually you can have. You can, you can, the pure APIs can be free because actually you 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 uh, you are you want to be a platform, and so you want people to add value to your platform. 
uh, you can pay developers to use your API uh, because you know it's about referral fee or success fees. Uh, it, you can um, uh, you can have developer paying to access your APIs because you save time because you manage a business process like uh, emailing or SMS or video calls. And so there's a piece of technology that you deliver. Uh, so it make people save time. Or you can have indirect business models where actually if you have ad advertisement or if you have other business model related to uh, uh, where APIs can actually have a big change, we can consider it's indirect business models. But now let's say there is also the pricing aspect. You know, a lot of new dimension in, in pricing. The, the data delivered by API can be less fresh, uh, uh, or uh, you can make pricing different based on freshness. On flow, is it more stock of data that you share or stream of data, like to have new data? For example, I think it's uh, the Yahoo Finance. If you allow, if you want the data more than few, if you accept few seconds, delay it's free. But if you want the data really, really fast, less than few milliseconds, you have to pay. It's about precision. If you want a non-precise data or more pre more accurate data, you will pay more. It's about like there are many many different aspects: a scope, quantity, performance, maintenance, support, license, branding. Many many dimensions of API pricing that can make new generation of business models based on digital infrastructure uh, that now company have uh, the ability to uh, to uh, to have. Of course, simple business models will be ever always better. But now you have a lot more cards to play when it's about uh, uh, monetizing your piece of infrastructure that you will deliver as a service to others. So building API as a product, uh, these companies were actually have their main product is our APIs like Stripe for payment, Twilio for communication, Adyen for payment, Segment for marketing, SendGrid for emailing, Avalara for tax calculation. And there are hundreds of them, right? And you can actually, you can actually achieve a lot of value just delivering APIs are your own, as your only product. So because, you, again, if you are able to give a capability that everybody else will integrate, you are winning horizontally. You know, you are completely winning the market horizontally. I'll just take the example of Avalara here that few people know. So Avalara, it's a tax calculation uh, platform, uh, you know, because in some countries, especially, but in the US, you know, the VAT, the value added tax is is uh, calculated on local basis. So you have to follow regulation based on uh, uh, the VAT in specific counties or, or, or states. And uh, and if you don't follow that, you can have a really strong fine. You know, uh, the internal revenue services can really follow you, follow you uh, 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 for that. So the goal is to be always be compliant and always apply the right uh, value added tax uh, a number. And so like this, they do jurisprudence and they help you Whatever the product category you are having in a e-commerce ba uh, uh, basket, they tell you the exact tax number that you should put. You know, it seems really, uh, really one nut or one bolt of the whole, uh, you know, uh, e-commerce supply chain. You know, uh, it's just in the cart when you have the list of uh, product and you have you want to calculate the VAT at this time. You call a Valara, they give you all the VAT numbers uh, for each category of product for each region. Uh, that where you deliver the product, you know, it seems it's really one piece, but it's a company that's still worth $15 billion because they're integrated in lots, lots of places uh, uh, there. So you can be one tiny value proposition in the global value proposition, but if you scale horizontally, you can achieve a main outstanding uh, value. So I wanted to share uh, that example. And again, in the landscape I build, I take a few, but you have thousands of now API products. Uh, that you can have there and that that you can integrate and that also are scaling just delivering APIs as product as their only product. About the integration, the external API part, there's one thing we call revitalizing the core. You know, example with banking. So, uh, of course, some companies have a lot of legacy, uh, but they can revitalize the core by integrating uh, capability of others via API products. So that's, that, that's just an example. So for, you know, how the banking as a service market is currently structured so now you have you can have um uh, core banking uh, card wallet transfer uh you can have uh, um, a money acquisition you can have many many things as lego bricks that actually where companies are actually doing one or few piece of this value uh, so at, at some point you can have uh, fraud monitoring multi-currency management nfc solution whatever virtual cards uh issuing cards and 
as capabilities. And actually, the goal as your company is just to have to you will be able to integrate these ones into your system. Uh, you know, some banks or some companies are actually integrating few of them, uh, you know, as a complete stack. But the most important to understand here is that, you know, um, the banking as a service ecosystem is that some banks today have monolith and they have legacy systems core or really old core banking, and they can't move that. It's too old software. They, they don't know how to do it, but they can integrate third-party banking as a service ecosystem when they can completely revitalize their core and uh, change uh, their refactor, their architecture and for business piece by piece. A little bit what I was showing earlier with the with the, the monolith and the external services, but now directly toward, toward the business. I'll just take an example of a company, TransferWise. So TransferWise is a company that do money transfer across frontiers, uh, but many, many banks actually used to do that service, you know, transfer money across uh, different countries, but they were too expensive. So now they use TransferWise as a bank. They use TransferWise APIs to do money transfer instead of their existing really too expensive money transfer because TransferWise is a lot better and they manage the system, the, the, the money transfer a lot better. So yeah, banks revitalize their offer, revitalize their core using third-party software uh, that, that does the exact same capabilities as they were doing, but better. So do, you can imagine what has happened in many, many industries. Last two points, it's also about reducing the time to market, you know, the API product time to market versus application time to market. You know, when you have an API most of the time, uh, you have technology or data, you have an API team that build the APIs, and then the APIs are meant to be used by developers who will build application to end users. So that's the kind of supply chain of, uh, of a developer uh, work. But let's say if you have an API, as we see here, the API first or API product strategy, you will build the API and then you ship, you make it live. So you learn about customer and use cases with your ecosystem, who consume your APIs, about what developers are doing, and then you build the application yourself and then you ship your application based on the, what the ecosystem is doing. So you learn when API is out. Okay, let's go back. If we think in, still in terms of application, you know, you will learn only when the application is out. So you will have taken a lot of risk, a lot of money, a lot of time, uh, and you will learn later. So shipping the API first before the application actually help you to learn so much uh, and to distribute value earlier. So to run, to monetize your uh, your uh, uh, your investment, but also to understand actually how to build better application. So the time to market is extremely important, and also to deliver product that are better fit with uh, the industry. And last point is about being compliant with regulation. Uh, this is a map about you know the open banking regulation uh, in the world. So you can see there are many many areas in the world that are different uh, uh, that are. Um, uh, that have different processes. Hong Kong has its early implementation. Uh, Europe has its own uh, advanced uh, regulation. Uh, in UK too, and India and Singapore and many, many places. But yeah, so, and these regulations oblige companies to open APIs in a neutral way to third parties, uh, uh, especially about account data or payment initiation. But still, the regulation directly advise to open APIs to third parties. So it's also one reason where it's time to shift to the API mindset is because uh, the regulator may ask you to do so. so. There are also regulation in healthcare, especially in the US or in Europe, uh, in, in, Southeast, in some countries in Southeast Asia. But yeah, regulation take care about how you should open APIs. So this is also a good reason to think in terms of, of regulation and be prepared. Also about the privacy, uh, privacy regulations now involve the fact that you have to be able to, be able to transfer data in an automatic, automated way, uh, in a machine readable way. And so at that point, you will have also to think in terms of APIs. So here, this is the map of uh, data protection around the world. Uh, in blue, it's mostly uh, like GDPR-like uh, uh, regulation, but you can see that uh, many 60 countries in the world have actually data protection law that consider from directly or indirectly APIs as a way uh, to manage personal data uh, protection. So yeah, you will need to think that in terms of, of regulation. So to sum up, API is the new API mindset for uh, tech business and regulation. It's about aligning IT with business, designing for business goals, killing technical debt using API facade, diminishing time to market by doing this API first versus application first strategy, get business adoption by being able to make APIs understandable by the business uh, and make them as a product, augment reach by addressing the long tail 
of customers, enable new business models and new monetization strategies based on, let's say, uh, the digital infrastructure uh, um, uh, um, uh, intrinsic uh, design. It's about integrating uh, commodities of others uh, to revitalize your own core. Uh, I hope it was insightful. If you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them. And I and I, and I wish you an enjoyful, a joyful uh, API at Hong Kong.